So, why do grades matter? Is it because it's a success metric and your level of achievement, which is just a fancy way of saying your use of time, is going to be judged? Or maybe you're worried about your friends and peers judging you or putting you down for your grades. Um, <laughs> you may start, like before you even see your grades or show them, you may start to become anxious or socially anxious in the latter. And your ears and cheeks may start to burn up as your throat contracts and your stomach gets filled with butterflies as your breathing, or your breathing, pardon me, speeds up. <sighs> wow, there are a lot of you here today. And of course, the people that will be watching after the fact. Well, hello, my name is Daquan Brown. I am a grade 11 student here at Old Skona Academic in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and am a strong advocate for lifelong learning. That is the learning and teaching of new and interesting things, which as a STEM instructor, I find very important. Awkward silence is another <laughs> situation that can invoke uh, this kind of social anxiety within people. However, I'm not actually nervous to present my speech today, uh, but that moment of awkward silence or that kind of seemingly shaky start may have made you yourself anxiety ridden about the speech that is upcoming as if you were the one up here presenting. Or maybe it's that feeling that you do get when you do show your parents that report card. Or just that feeling that you get in general when you want to succeed in something and you're going to be externally judged about it. So why do you want to do well in certain things? Like why does that even matter? This became the center of today's topic. What makes up your perception of success? Why do you want to do well in certain things and in others, not so much? Why do you not care as much about those other things? Well, like, the, like, like this presentation, what makes up your perception of success has recently become a focal point in my life recently. I began questioning my identity from the standpoint of this topic. Why do I like what I like? Why do I do what I do? And what has brought me here today? Well, after um, kind of Googling my question, um, you know, deep dive search told me that my answer would probably be somewhere on Google. I Googled um, this question, what makes up your perception of success? And after scrolling for a long, long, <laughs> long amount of time, I ended up not really finding a nice comprehensive answer for today that I can just present to you and say, here, look, this is a nice answer. But I did find quite a few indirect studies on the situation or topic and through a little bit of work of my own and a lot of work of them I managed to string together these topics into a nice presentation for you all today. So what does make up our perception of sex success pardon me <laughs> why do you want to do well in certain things like um, sports or instruments or an artistic medium? <laughs> Well, it turns out that emotions actually have a lot to do with it. Um, the emotions that we talked about at the beginning. So for those that can't see, uh, this is an emotion wheel, or commonly known as an emotion wheel in psychology. And it seems like we are a lot more perceptive to negative emotions. And again, for those that can't see, this right here is happy emotions. This, this, that, that, and that are all negative emotions. Uh, these are the common emotions that you'll experience through your life, and that small sliver of purple, that's like, depends. Like, you could wake up on the wrong side of bed, you'll feel bad, right? <laughs> right, so this is commonly known as the negativity bias, and it, is also, it also accounts for the reason why you dwell more on negative interactions than positive ones, and why a day a good day can just go bad because maybe you walked out onto the streets and it did not look both ways and then a car had to unexpectedly stop for you and now you're dwelling on that situation. You will never meet that person again and yet you are still thinking of that situation. This also developed in our English lexicon and is the reason why that wheel has so many negative emotions because in the or there are statistically way, way more words to describe negative emotions, or as Robert W. Schwartz puts it, negative emotions require more detailed thinking, more subtle distinctions, so they require more names. So, with that being said, um, this negative uh, bias is common in quite a lot of us, well, actually everyone, um, and interestingly enough, um, <laughs> the reason for it is kind of lies in the fact that in the past, it was very important for us to perceive negative emotions. So biologically, uh, research shows us that we are not very physically capable without our tools, or 
knowledge, shared knowledge, that is. Right? In fact, a uh, poll by YouGov, <laughs> uh, the question being, which of the following animals, if any, do you think you could be in a fight if you were unarmed, showed that 50% or 51% believed that they could not, or that they could not beat a dog, a medium-sized dog, in a fight. <laughs> and that 51% is probably right. Without some kind of knowledge about what the dog is, so anatomical knowledge, or experience of what the dog will do next, so some experience or premonition on what it'll do, you will probably, unfortunately, get mauled to death. <laughs> this is why police use canines, right? Um, with that being said, that meant that really, really, really early on, like 50,000 BCE, it was very important for us <laughs> to um, live in tribes, because that was really the only way to survive. Relatively large groups of people that ensured your protection for something that you offered them, right? And a part of that was developing a knack for um, emotional perception of your environment, right? So noticing um, whether people liked you, group relations, right? So noticing whether people liked you, very important. Uh, this graph behind me, by the way, is a study that, or from Tohoku, Tohoku University, um, that demonstrates uh, two different kind of traits that developed. So early on, right, while we were non-humans, the 136 ASN trait was a trait that was not very perceptive to anxiety or anxiety prone, whereas the 136 THR trait was, and this was the trait that got passed on. Now the balancing selection just refers to the exceptions to this today, and that's 136 LLE. They still are more negative um, or anxiety prone, but less so than the man with his head down up there. <laughs> and so yeah, really early on, we had to develop a knack for human relations, right? It was very, very important. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this is my drawing. <laughs> um, so, no, <laughs> no, no, you're good. You're so um, yeah, so really early on, we had to develop a knack for um, human relations, and that was important because uh, if you didn't develop human relations, it meant certain death against the medium-sized dogs of that time. <laughs> yeah. So um, no, still you're still good. You're still good. <laughs> and so um, back in the past, right? Um, it was, or historically and contemporarily, it is important for us to um, recognize this fact that we have to develop these or and maintain these group relations. Um, sorry, and maintain these group relations. Um, and so, as you can see here, um, this is a person who is in, uh, affected by this kind of fact, right? Um, they are feeling left out, and so they want to get in on the fun. Um, and this happens quite a bit. Um, and yeah, so historically and contemporarily, it was very, very important for us to develop that idea of uh, group relations. With that in mind, um, this also applies, uh, or this is also super important for impressing your kind of higher class figures or important people in your tribes. The reason for this is because uh, they can provide you more security in your trap or higher or more privileges or higher or better treatments, right? This also applies today. Um, if your friends, right, are displeased with you, they can just, they'll probably just stop being friends with you. You might get into a scuffle with them. However, if your parents are displeased with you, they can stop feeding you, right? So, <laughs> so it's pretty important that they are pleased, much more important um, that they are pleased than if um, your friends are pleased. I kind of like this graphic. It kind of shows how this behavior affects us, right? So all the way at the bottom is laws of science. These are things that you are physically impossible to do. So in terms of determining how you can act, laws of science, you can't breathe in outer space. You cannot walk on lava unscathed. Um, and you can't, like, get crushed and then inflate again like the car dealership mascots, right? <laughs> Just above that is laws of the state. These are things you can't legally do. You can't rob someone, right? You can't uh, assault someone. One of you can just walk up here and slap me on stage because I made a joke about you. <laughs> and then just above that is etiquette. These are things that you can legally do um, and physically do, but aren't socially acceptable. For example, you should hold your knife with your right hand and your fork with your left hand, right? Or you shouldn't be making obnoxious noises during a lovely 
TEDx presentation. <laughs> and just above that is self-consciousness. This is Hobbes's contractinarianism, and this is what we were referring to before. So these are things that you can do socially, legally, and physically, but still make you react in some negative way. Sure, you could play another game of League of Legends uh, when you should be doing uh, or practicing some important thing to you, like club sports or an instrument or your artistic medium. Or yes, you could cram for a formative quiz because it's formative, but why would you? Where are your priorities, right? People expect more from you or maybe you expect more from yourself. <laughs> okay, so with that in mind, um, obviously, again, uh, environments, uh, environmental expectations have an effect on your behavior. They make a difference in how you act and what you do, right? So maybe we should just avoid environments with high expectations that ste greedily steal our free will and force us to make decisions that aren't really our own. Or maybe just no expectations at all because then we can roam around freely, albeit we might make a lot of mistakes, but at the very least, we won't be riddled with anxiety and regret as we attempt to meet expectations. Not so fast, because if you're anything like me, the sheer amount of energy that you get from a threatened zero on an assignment that's three hours away from being due is, after you've been awake for 27 hours, is a mighty fine substitute for coffee. So, let's look at one of my friends as an example of the environment that we just talked about. Ted Xavier, we called him TEDx for short. <laughs> so TEDx is, or TEDx's environment, TEDx now feels as though he's not academically challenged, which is something he valued. And now, or as TEDx describes, his, his environment is rather lackluster in academic prestige or the promotion of academic prestige or challenges slash achievements. And so Ted feels as though Relatively to his peers, he's doing excellent. However, it's not as good as he could have been doing is if he got that kind of pressure or his environment promoted those kind of expectations. Right, so without going um, further much into TEDx's environments, um, low expectation, not very challenging for Ted, causes disinterest for Ted, and Ted feels stagnant and complacent, right? Without going to, into much further into TEDx's environment, I think a lot of us can relate to TEDx on some level. Right? A lot of us have been in an environment where things felt too easy, things didn't feel challenging enough, and so it bred disinterest. We didn't really want to try, and it became like we were stagnant and complacent. This now doesn't sound that interesting or that valuable, right? Because, stagnant, because all your achievements, successes, and values now will be replaced by stagnation and complacency. So maybe we got it right the first time. Maybe we should be aiming for environments with high expectations that demand a lot from us. Well, not so fast with that one as well. <laughs> Another drawing of mine. Uh, Vivian's environments. Now, Vivian is another friend of mine. Vivian attended a prestigious high school of her own and did exceptionally well from grade 10 to 12 and recently finished her high school applications or her university applications, pardon me. I know this because Vivian uh, had an existential crisis and conveyed this through me, or conveyed this to me through text, where she demonstrated that she wasn't really fond of what she was actually going into, which was STEM, because her environment promoted STEM fairly frequently uh, and high academic prestige. It meant that Vivian decided from early on that the fault was STEM and that she needed high marks because, well, that's what her environment promoted. So why not? Right? Um, however, Vivian then didn't get to explore other interests that she might have because, well, she doesn't want to risk losing the high marks that she has, right? And she already defaulted to STEM. So Vivian applied to STEM and is not actually very fond of it. <laughs> that is another unfortunate, unfortunate situation. And so maybe high expectations is also not the right environment. Or like, which one's better, right? high expectations or the lower expectations of TEDx's environment. Some of you may be thinking of Vivian's because she's still at least prepared for the future and she can make some changes along the way if she's interested in other things. Or some of you might be thinking, well, TEDx just needs to be more internally motivated towards his goals. And so he actually has the better environment. Well, as corny as it is, the answer is actually more about balance. For the vast majority of people, finding a happy middle is what's important to this kind of talk, right? I can't just give you two anecdotal examples and then say, oh, this one is better for your environment, right? For some, some people may find Vivian's environment a bit better, and some may find TEDx's environment better. 
However, again, the vast majority will need to find the happy middle. Now, I can't necessarily find that happy middle for you. However, um, I can tell you that the hardest part is usually realizing that that's not where you currently are. So again, the answer is kind of corny, but you must find that balance or happy middle yourself. And so before I leave you all today, I want to leave you with a lingering question, a lingering important question. Is your environment conducive to your ideas of success? That is, are you, or is your environment giving you opportunities for your ideas of success? Or is your environment producing your ideas of success? Thank you.